My name is Allison Collins, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this discussion between Ian Wallace and Christine Poggi. Tonight's talk and the two remaining discussions in the series have been supported by the Canadian Art Foundation through its international speaker series. We'd like to thank the director, Ann Webb, for her great enthusiasm in supporting lectures across the country. And we'd also like to thank the Canadian Art Foundation as co-presenter of these talks. We'd also like to acknowledge the BMO Financial Group who support the Canadian Art Foundation. The next conversation will be next week, uh, the same night, with Stan Douglas. And following and final conversation will be with Victor Bergen on February 19th. And as I imagine you're almost all familiar with Ian Wallace and his work, I'll open tonight's discussion instead with an introduction briefly to Christine Poggi. Christine is a professor of art history at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of In Defiance of Painting, Cubism, Futurism, and the Invention of Collage, and Inventing Futurism, the Art and Politics of Artificial Optimism. She has also written, for most of you who probably have this, an excellent piece on Ian's work magazine piece for the exhibition catalog. Tonight, Christine will provide us with a little entrance to her work as an art historian in the realm of collage with a short introduction, after which she'll be joined up on stage with Ian to engage in a larger discussion about collage and Ian's practice. Um, and I know Christine's work on the history of collage has been really of particular interest in Ian, who really spurred us forward to invite her here. And so I'd like to welcome him up here to introduce her a little bit further to you all. Thank you, Allison, and uh, wonderful to see everybody back again for another conversation. Um, yeah, uh, as you can probably see from the exhibition, and those of you that know me well and know my work and have known me as an instructor in the past, uh, that uh, as well as my uh, you know, lifelong career as an artist, um, I spent 30 years as an art history instructor at uh, the original Vancouver School of Art and UBC before that in the 60s and, and on. Uh, so art history has always had a very, very important place in my creative life. And it's, it's I've, I've treated the academic side of art history because it is an academic discipline very, very seriously. And I really enjoy uh, doing the research that's involved with art history on the, on the personal level, always did. and. Uh, always made sure that it contributed, in a sense, to my artistic insights. And uh, one of the aspects of my work, especially the work that um, is, say, runs from the magazine pieces on and right on through, especially with the uh, works that involve photographs laminated on the canvas, um, it makes direct reference to the whole issues of collage that surfaced in the development of modernism in the early 20th century. Uh, col the collage aesthetic has always had a very, very strong rapport with the Vancouver artists and poets and the link between the literary and the artistic development in Vancouver. Um, in the, uh, 1968, I actually, with the uh, poet Bill Bissett, um, I opened, uh, worked on a gallery for a very short period called the Mandan Ghetto Gallery, in which we did exhibitions of collage and concrete poetry. Uh, another really important uh, exhibition of collage early in Vancouver was the collage show curated by Christos Stichiakos and Julius Pagonis at uh, 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 the UBC Fine Arts Gallery, w in which uh, it's where I did my first really fully finished magazine piece was exhibited in that show. So, uh, you know, the issues about around collage are really, really key and central to my work. And we'll carry on some discussion when, after Christine develops her, presents her her uh, talk, uh, we're going to be in conversation. So some of those comments will come up later to fill you in. But uh, when uh, we put together this exhibition with Dinah Agaitis and talking about what kind of texts and what kind of discussion or uh, writing should be in the catalog, I thought I'd like to have a, a real art historian uh, contribute something you know, uh, uh, about my work, uh, and particularly in collage. And, um, uh, there is, in my uh, researches into the history of collage, I came across uh, the, this book, In Defiance of Painting, which is uh, the uh, book published by um, Christine, uh, 1992, I forget the exact publication date, yeah, that's 1992, and it's been a kind of a on hand ever since, and I constantly dip into this book and refer to it, because it has all of the 
key uh, works and figures that uh, around the that I think about and kind of uh, puzzle about and and still trying to kind of in a sense uh, figure out in what relationship my work would have to this earlier work and whether I'm doing a kind of a recherche kind of move on it or whether I'm developing it into the future. Um, in any case, uh, I just want to say that uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Christine here join us tonight in conversation coming all the way from Philadelphia where she uh, is a teacher and a professor of art history at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, so she's going to do uh, present a talk here that is, I think, quite closely related to uh, this book, In Defiance of Painting. And um, um, please also uh, have a good read of the, her essay on the magazine piece. It's in my catalog, which I really appreciate. It. Excellent essay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank everyone at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, of course, Ian Wallace has been wonderful in inviting me here. I feel very, very honored to be able to engage his work, which interests me very, very much. I think our intellectual paths have really crossed, although we only discovered it, or at least I only discovered it recently. And I'd like to thank everyone else who's uh, helped to organize this, Susan Collins and Dana Agaitis and, and so forth. So thank you very much. So what I'd like to do now is just introduce some of the ideas that I think um, were of interest to, to me in exploring the invention of collage in 1912 in the work of Picasso and Brock in particular. And then more recently, I've been very interested also in the monochrome and in abstraction. And so those are two paradigms of modernism that emerge around the same time, 1912, 13, 14, and so on. And both of those have been absolutely fundamental to Ian Wallace's thinking, his practice. And we can see them as separate developments, but also intertwined in a lot of very interesting ways. So I'm going to just take you through a little bit of background on collage and a little bit about the, the monochrome, and then bring them together in an investigation of magazine piece and some of his other work. Um, I'd like to just open with uh, this work. This is Picasso's The Scallop Shell from the spring of 1912. And here, this is just at the moment, just prior to the invention of collage in Picasso's work. And what, uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, excellent, okay. So what we have here is the intrusion of a foreign element. I think of collage not only as the literal um, injection of some foreign elements, some heterogeneous elements such as newspaper or wallpaper or bottle labels or what have you into a painting, very specifically into painting, but really any very disruptive element. And in this case, you see Picasso already wanting to disrupt the oil painting that you see on the left by painting in Ripollin enamel, which is commercial enamel, the colors of the French flag. And he took that. It's an appropriated element from this French aviation brochure that you see on the right, um, which unfortunately I don't have to show you in color. But you have here in the work on the left, already in the spring, a still life. It's, I know it's a little hard to read. You see some scallop shells, uh, a pipe, a little pipe up here. You have a, a kind of wine glass in the center. So it's very fragmentary, difficult to read. And then the intrusion of these flat planes, uh, referring to the French flag, and that glossy enamel, which is not a fine art medium. So the kind of radical juxtaposition of oil paint with enamel, something taken from the commercial realm with this more muted palette, very fine tonalities, and so on. And also an early reference, as you can see here, to the word journal, which is French for newspaper. So the newspaper already making a kind of appearance. So just this interest in the heterogeneous, the disruptive, taking things from popular culture and sort of inserting them into a more traditional fine art context. Um, the other major paradigm that we'll be talking about, I won't devote quite as much time to it, but I think it's very central to Ian's practice, is the monochrome. And whereas collage introduces the heterogeneous and brings the world in, brings elements of everyday life, brings the newspaper, brings wallpaper, bottle labels, adver adver advertisements, and brings you, in a sense, outside of the traditional frame of the work of art to the real world. The monochrome, which emerges at just about the same time, 
as a very radical form of abstraction, and this is perhaps the most radical example of it in the work of Kazimir Malevich, a Russian artist working uh, and developing this amazingly in the middle of World War I in 1915, where basically the black comes in to obliterate what is underneath, which is another composition with colors. It is probably an abstract composition. It seems to be abstract geometric forms. People have been able to see under the cracked surface that there is a prior composition under there. But it stands for a kind of refusal of representation, uh, an obliteration of that reference to the everyday world, even to geometric forms and compositions, to get at the most radically simplified format possible, a black square on a larger black square. And what you can see here is the idea that painting could somehow be self-referential, autonomous, that it could refer to itself rather than to something in the outside world. So it's no longer telling stories, not representing you know, scenes from nature or anything. And in a sense, I think by making the surface black, it refers to that obliteration, a kind of wiping out of representation, blanketing it out. But what Malevich wanted and what he wrote about was not only uh, a kind of privation of normal vision through this notion of darkness, uh, but also the idea that you would experience that black as a very intensified form of sensation in itself. So there's an idea of being here, or of presence, a kind of self-presence of the color, which is what it is, without attempting to refer you to something that's not there. The white is very interesting as well. I think it functions as a kind of frame, but it also, for Malevich, strangely, represents the absence of sensation. So he's got the sensation in the black, according to his own writings about this, and either infinity, the abyss, or the absence of sensation, he describes the white as referring to all of those. So kind of sensation versus its absence, which is paradoxical since you have to, in a sense, create a sensation of the absence of sensation. So I think these are very paradoxical things. But it spells a kind of extreme point within the history of modernism and the tension between letting the world in through collage and trying to exclude it in order to create something autonomous, self-referential, utterly pure, involved in a notion of self-presence. Um, those two poles still animate, I think, Ian Wallace's practice. And he's been, I think, very um, committed to going back to these fundamental moments and trying to figure out, so this happened just prior to World War I or in World War I, and what does it mean? What are the consequences of this kind of thinking in the post-World War II period. Um, the ideals and um, utopian aspect that I think is in both of those practices, what Picasso is doing, and also what Malevich and other abstract artists are doing, uh, I think there was a sense that it did not achieve what it hoped to achieve in utopian terms. And so the question that I, I, I really want to ask of Ian as we converse later will be um, how he regards these practices once we get to the post-World War II period. Um, so I'd like to just go back and look at these a little bit more in detail. Um, this is, these are two of Picasso's collages from very early on, from 1912. We know that he probably made them around October, November, because people have been able to date the news clippings and so forth. And what you see here is a kind of practice that reduces the act of drawing. There's a kind of de-skilling here. Picasso is the most gifted draftsman of the 20th century. I think everybody would probably agree he knows how to draw. He can draw. Um, but he's reducing his practice of drawing to the act of cutting very, very simple shapes. And there's an intellectual act here of composing, of putting heterogeneous elements together. In the guitar that you see here on the left, you have the wallpaper ground, and you have a very interesting figure ground kind of situation going on back and forth. I read uh, his interest in using already figured grounds in this musical score here and in his own glass, which he treats as a kind of appropriated element, something he can now put in the context of these other mass-produced, commercially produced elements, which are ready-mades that he appropriates and then introduces. But he cuts them and shapes them, and I read this actually as a kind of combined right edge, which is square-edged of a guitar 
and on the left side you have a curved edge. And you have the mass-produced wallpaper. This is the kind of hand-painted faux grain, uh, faux bois, wood grain pattern that he made. Um, sometimes he used commercially produced wallpaper. Sometimes he produced it himself with a painter's comb. And then the little, the little fragment of newspaper down there. So this is one of the most archetypal. And what you see on the right is another one in, when, in which there's actually no drawing. I think it's really significant that just cutting, shaping, and descaling, involving a kind of process that it seems almost anyone could do, although what then comes to the fore is the conceptual aspect, the imaginative aspect of using these unusual materials in this new way. And there is a pin actually holding the little square sound hole in the middle. Um, this I brought in just to talk a little bit more about newspaper, which I think is one of the most common materials that Picasso uses. It introduces the news, and it, it can't help, even if you regard it as a formal element, which it certainly is as well, it can't help but suggest that world of what's happening, the actualities, you know, the, the things that are being announced in the newspaper. And there are, are many controversies in the history of art about whether or not you should actually read the text. But many times there are, are jokes in these texts, um, and it seems to me that it's inevitable that we will read it to some extent. So there's a kind of changing focal, focal point. Uh, you can get up close, you can move back and regard it as a kind of figure on a ground. The work on the left I brought in to talk about the notion of materiality, the texture. Again, this is a work just prior to the invention of collage, and you see Picasso engaging with all kinds of different textures, really thick facture, what the Russians called factura, which is just the making, the emphasis on materiality, dissonant textures, feeling for the very stuff of paint. And later, Picasso will take that up by putting actual objects, newspaper, playing cards. He puts sand, dust, uh, metal shavings on some of these works. They're so really interested in the materiality, getting a kind of feeling for texture and tactility of the object. And uh, this is, again, a newspaper. A uh, little, little part of l'intransigeante, right? So it's a little reference to newspaper. The other thing I like about the example on the right is that you can see Picasso, uh, Picasso I think, interested in, perhaps we can say, local practices of reading. That is, newspapers aren't just flat elements as we we're all taught by Clement Greenberg and others that simply restate the flatness of the picture plane. Here, Picasso has cut out a shape and then flipped over the piece that was left over and used it in the upper right-hand corner. So you have a sense of something being flipped over in the other side of a newspaper. I don't know if you, can you all see that? So that outline is then, it's one piece of paper that's been cut in half and one side has been flipped over. So I actually think there's an aspect of that in Ian, Ian's work as well, where he very often will cut something, move it, reposition it, or somehow allude to the fact of the double-sidedness. And you see that a little bit in magazine piece as well, which I'll uh, mention later. And then, of course, there's the intriguing possibility that Picasso was aware of Mallarmé's work, and in particular of Mallarmé's poem, Un coup de dé jamais n'abolira le hasard. This is a very famous poem it, that was um, a kind of important example, a very early example of a kind of concrete poetry in the work of Stéphane Mallarmé, a symbolist poet, who didn't, he, he, in his writings, he talks about contesting newspaper, about the newspaper being cheap and commercial, about its pages being flopped open, they're flat for him. They don't include the thickness of the book, which is sort of secret um, recesses. He talks about the pleasures of cutting the pages of the book and the reader being almost like a lover of the book. Um, so the reading a book is a very different experience, and particularly poetry for Mallarmé, than reading what he regards as the cheap, commodified pages of the newspaper. And so in Mallarmé's text, he's always setting up this opposition. And he talks about the very strident headlines of newspapers, that they, so they sort of screaming at you, and that there's this very rigid sense of columns, that the text has to fit the columns of the newspaper, and that this is highly monotonous. So in this poem, I think what Mallarmé is doing is, in a sense, 
demonstrating the mobility of language, making it almost like a musical score, spreading it out across a double page spread. The words are treated almost as objects, visual objects on a page, and you become very conscious of the white of the page itself as having a kind of glowing presence. Um, and they become pictorial. So this particular example that I brought in from the poem is just one of the two page spreads that he actually talked about in one of his letters as representing a listing boat. So I think you can kind of see that there's a boat here um, with a, a kind of mast. And the last page, which I didn't, the last double page spread, which I did not break in, represents a constellation of stars. And Mallarmé also talks about wanting to think about those black letters as brilliant, as luminous. And he thinks about them as stars. So you have to, in your mind, transpose light and dark here. The dark lettering becomes luminous. It becomes a kind of brilliant light. And so he's interested in these kind of transpositions, and I think in a kind of transcendence almost, a kind of spiritualization of the book. Um, the title is dispersed throughout the 20 pages of the text so that it never becomes too strident. You sort of read it across many pages. And what we have in this example is Picasso uh, cutting out a piece of newspaper so that part of the text says un coup de thé, which would be a cup of tea, but it's really cropped from something that says a coup, uh, un coup de théâtre. Um, it refers to the Balkan Wars. But I think the way it's cropped probably suggests a kind of pun on Mallarmé's poem. So it suggests that there is perhaps a dialogue, at least I, I think there is, between Picasso's use of newspaper and particularly using this commodified commercial form of popular cultural material. And then the, the debate is, what, what's he doing with it, right? Is he transfiguring it a la Mallarmé, or is he allowing it to remain cheap and commercial? And I, I'm more on the side of the latter, although I think it does get integrated into the work of art. I think in the work of Picasso, it insistently refers you to the world of the everyday the world of com commercial culture and of popular commodified forms of writing. Um, I brought in just a few, other, you know, a few other examples of artists who have been very interested in Mallarmé. Um, Ian Wallace is certainly not the only one, and so he's in excellent company. This is a work by the Belgian artist Marcel Brotars, who did this wonderful piece in 69, and uh, this is around the same time that I think Ian Wallace is getting interested in Mallarmé's work as well. And here, there's a sense that Mallarmé's words don't signify in the normal way. We look at them almost as objects and visual forms on a page. They become almost pictorial elements. And what Brotars did in this book, which has semi-transparent pages, so you sort of see through and you imagine turning the pages and the mobility and flow of the text, but he's obliterated the words entirely. So you see the pattern on the page. So you have that sense of poetry becoming a form of silence, something that can, can only be sort of imagined, um, but not, you wouldn't, you don't need to actually read it. And then this work is something that I'm interested to see what Ian Wallace might have to say about it. This is a work that has many, many iterations. I think it was done for the first time in the 70s. Um, it's a work by the Italian artist Mario Mertz. And again, it's a tribute to Mallarmé, Af Mallarmé, and again to the very famous poem, Un coup de dé, which is a throw of the dice, will never abolish chance. And what you have here is Merritt's taking a set of newspapers, the Italian newspaper, it's a socialist paper, um, La Stampa, and creating a kind of wall out of all of these um, issues of this paper and interfusing it with uh, n a newspaper that's Arabic. And the front page of La Stampa over and over again, it's the same issue over and over again, is declaring, it's Bush's proclamation of, a, of um, basically a threat of war against, against Iran. So that's the subject matter. So it's about political conflict, and it seems to me that he's created a kind of wall, a barrier. The newspapers are in different colors. They almost seem to create like bricks or, or you know, some kind of wall or barrier, barricade that would have been thrown up. And then there's this sense of a throw of the dice. You know, we can read that in different ways. It, it could be read perhaps as um, Bush kind of throwing out a challenge, not knowing what's going to happen in this political context. 
the words which are here in neon, in blue neon, this is a commercial form of lighting, right? So it's, it's taking Mallarmé's very elevated notion of poetry, turning into luminosity on the page and making it cheap and commercial. And I think for me, it, it, in certain configurations, it, certain photographs, it looks like barbed wire on a fence and it blocks your path. So really putting it into a more politicized context and making you reflect on the work of art um, and its engagement with the real world and um, a kind of perhaps ironic statement of the failure perhaps of poesis or the continuing desire for a kind of poetry in this context. The other thing that has really interested me in Ian's work is his use of the schema, the conceptual model. And this is something that even in a small way goes back to Picasso, but I think it becomes much more important in works of art in the post-World War II period where we get seriality, developing something in a very serial, conceptual way based on an original idea or concept, which is then simply executed. Um, but Picasso, this is uh, his constructed guitar from 1912, same exact moment that he's working on the early collages. And he made it out of paper, wire. It's a very materially interesting work. Glue, wire, you can see from these photographs of the interior just how messy this was. Um, you know, very cheaply constructed. It's got pins, it's got staples, thread that he's actually sewed. You can see Picasso and his very messy sewing right there. Also underneath, and look at the incredibly messy use of tape and wire and string to hold this thing together. So I think this emphasis on letting the constructedness of this be visible was part of the work. But the reason I bring it in here is simply to talk about the fact that when Picasso was questioned about this work by his friend Andre Salmon, a poet, who said derisively, oh, that looks like anybody could make it. Picasso said, yes, and I will sell the plan, and then any, 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 just anybody can make it. So he embraced that idea, and he said that he would commercialize the plan, which he did not do. But I think it's interesting that there's already this idea that what is interesting and important, in a sense, is the idea, the plan, the execution, which is very de-skilled and deliberately shoddy and messy. Is, it's, you know, it's not about craft. So we have a kind of erosion of craft in the early 20th century and an increasing emphasis on conceptual forms of labor. And I think this is something that Picasso's work also engages and that I think also Ian Wallace's work engages. What is labor in the modern world? Should we cling to older forms of craft production when general social technique has moved away from that in general, right? So there's a way in which artists, I think, reflect on critically, um, and, and in some ways even perhaps respond to or mimic more general social forms of labor and the demise of craft and the rise of material forms of popular culture, machine-produced objects, synthetic materials, all of these things are things that Picasso's work does address. Um, and this is just to show you that the work could then take on many different configurations. Here he puts the guitar into a larger assemblage. And something that I also find intriguing is the use of this bottle, this piece over here on the right, that is probably a ready-made stencil. And Picasso simply includes it in this larger configuration. On the left you have wallpaper with wood grain, which he would have bought and used in this assemblage to signify the very wall on which the work of art is hanging. So Picasso is interested here in calling attention to the framing conventions of the work of art, that something would hang on a wall and represent the wall itself which is something that many of Ian's work seem to take into account. And then this very early use of a ready-made stencil as an element in this work of art. So I think these are things that even prior to Duchamp's use of the ready-made, uh, about a year later, he's already seeming to engage the idea of the ready-made, although he does put it into a larger context with other elements. I, I really, I only recently discovered this work and I wanted to bring it in. This is one of Rauschenberg's pieces um, from 1953, also very early in Rauschenberg's work when he does a whole series of boxes. And what I found intriguing, and perhaps because I'd already been looking at Ian Wallace's work, was this, this transparent box that he made that goes inside the wooden crate. And I couldn't help but read this now as a schema. 
It's kind of the um, something on a transparent and hence perhaps more idealized material, a material that almost vanishes, that doesn't have the density and heaviness and weight and texture of that wood. So it's almost to me representing the idea of the box as an almost platonic idea, something ideal, and then it gets realized in this heavy wood, and it sits inside it, so it's actually not quite separate from it, it's part of it. And I was just intrigued by this. I thought, you know, he doesn't call it a schema, but I'm now, partly based on looking at Ian Wallace's work, I'm thinking of that box as a kind of schema. So now I'm gonna turn to Ian Wallace's work and try to make some connections between some of the things I've been mentioning. And here's one of his early monochromes on the left. This one is in the exhibition. I hope you have all seen it. And so, you know, I think I'd like to come back to this, but what we have on the right is Ian Wallace's schema, made s many years later, actually, but it represents his thinking about the monochrome. So he wrote his master's thesis on the abstract artist Piet Mondrian and was interested in Mondrian's uh, eventually reducing his art to primary colors and then also the tonalities of white, black, and gray. And what you see here is in the schema on the right, him laying out all the possibilities, just sort of enumerating them as an intellectual act. So you have yellow, white, gray, red, blue, and um, <coughs> black. Those are the possibilities in terms of colors. And then each one has a frame around it of one of those colors. So, you know, there, there's a painting, as I understand it, of every one of these options, which are simply laid out and can be executed. And some of them can be remade, right? Because it, it's really, I think the painting does have importance, but it's also the idea that's driving it. And this is something that goes far beyond what I think Picasso would have done in terms of thinking of a plan or an idea, because now it's in a kind of serial production that rationally goes through all of the options. I'd like to come back to this work and ask him about the format um, and about the, the use of the white frame. So those are things that we saw in the Malevich as well, this kind of framing that is now internal to the object. This is his schema for a magazine piece which I hope all of you have seen. So this is um, on a piece of kind of translucent vellum and lays out one possible configuration or kind of idea of a configuration for the magazine piece, which involves somebody, as you can see in the directions at the bottom, um, the cover and facing pages of a mass circulation magazine attached to a wall in a given arrangement until exhausted by the format. So you if you, you know, if you want to execute one of these, you would purchase the schema, um, not that much, not very expensive, and then you can execute it yourself. You can get a, a mass circulation newspaper, you put up the cover, and then every facing page. So you, you're missing every other page because you, you don't see the versos, right? You're only seeing the facing page laid out in this kind of grid. Um, and I love the idea of exhaustion so you have this serial production, right? The seriality is going to take over. It's just going to run. You're going to follow the rule. And it will be exhausted either if the m magazine runs out of pages, that that's the end. Or maybe the wall. Will, you'll run out of wall space. Maybe you have a few more pages, but you have to leave two off because you ran out of wall. So this possibility of exhaustion interests me. I'd like to hear more, more about that and the idea that the system almost has within it something that's winding down or that that's a kind of limit that to me points to a kind of lack of perfect perfection or a possibility of that. Um, this is the magazine that first grabbed Ian's attention when he was thinking about making magazine piece. It was this issue of Look magazine um, from November 18th, 1969, and you see on the cover uh, the two actors that were in Zabriskie Point. Um, and so the first version of this, which I'm going to show you now, is not yet the definitive version of magazine piece. It was kind of the original idea. So he's going for something mass-produced, very popular, out there in the world that probably most people would have seen. And here's a great shot. I love this photograph. This is a studio shot. So you see him kind of working it out. He's not really sure what he's going to do. He's laying it out on the ground. He's trying out different configurations. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty casual. 
and he's, but he's documenting the process with photographs so that you have different layers of process. You have the, the, the working out, the photograph which documents that, which becomes a work of art in its own right. And then he lays out part of this look magazine, not the whole thing in this case, and he just has a piece of, um, of masking tape running across it, just fixing it to the wall. So it's very casual in terms of process. It reminds me of Picasso's of use of masking tape and just simple, messy stuff, tacks, sticking things to the wall. So what's really important is the concept. This is a concept piece. It's the disruption of this mass media, you know, artifact. Um, it's very serialized. It's not Picasso in the sense that Picasso was cutting and shaping things and playing with bigger ground. But we have a kind of seriality. We have things strung out in a line, and it introduces, for me, a notion of narrative a notion that you could do an act of reading. You could move from left to right, but it's going to be interrupted in a very regular way. So there's a kind of syntax that comes in, a very regular beat, but there are pieces missing, and you're never going to be able to get the whole meaning because you, you, know, you, you could try lifting up the pages and looking at the other side, but it's going to be hard to do. So y there's a sense of incompletion and rupture and a reconfiguration of something that you know, is an everyday artifact. So this linearity is one thing that you'll see in a lot of Ian Wallace's work, the idea of a line that might be a line on the street. It might be a line that you would walk across. It might be the line of narrative, a line of text in a poem. It seems to introduce notions of movement. And what interests me, too, about this is it's, it's very ideal in some ways. It's very abstract, but it's also very real. Right? You can sometimes you're just walking on a line. So that's one format. And this is how it's configured here in the exhibition. So I hope all of you have seen a magazine piece. They've managed to find this original you know, copy of Look magazine from 1969. And there it is in living color, which is great to see. And there you can see one of the monochromes in the back in this installation shot. Um, and here's just a close up so you can see uh, the magazine laid out on the wall with the masking tape. Um, this is uh, another version of magazine piece from 1970 in which we uh, see Ian Wallace is again being attracted to something with a kind of polemical social content. In this, in this case, it's the massacre at Kent State that occurred in 1970. This is a very famous issue of Life magazine that had some very, very famous photos of that tragedy that happened at Kent State. So in this case, we have the entire magazine starting with the front cover. So as we saw in schema, the whole thing is laid out. And now instead of being in a line, we have this other modernist paradigm, which is the grid. And both of those are very interesting um, to, as formats. We might want to talk about those. And you can see the, the masking tape running through, creating a kind of linearity. And I think linking the work, um, it reminds me also, though, of a kind of um, partial obliteration of text. It reminds me of Marcel Brotar sort of wiping out lines of text in Mallarmé, so you know, parts of this are being masked by the masking tape itself. And here's just a close-up of some of those scenes of magazine piece and the, the photographs of Kent State. So this is definitely bringing in the real world, right? This is the opposite, in a sense, of the monochrome. It's really about what's happening in the world and the way that those events are portrayed in the mass media. Um, and then here's a more recent realization, this one went with Bomb Magazine here in the galleries. Bomb Magazine is a, an art magazine. And here, the whole wall has been painted red. I was sort of interested to see that. Um, what you have is that sense of the wall, as in Mallarmé's works, of the ground itself, either the white of the page or the color of the wall, becoming an aspect of the work itself, becoming part of, an integral part of the composition. And now the, the masking tape is black and running through and creating this kind of pattern on the wall. And you can see schema over on the right hanging on the wall so that you're really invited to make a comparison between, um, you see that there? That's the schema. So you're invited to make a comparison between the idea and the various material realizations which will differ depending on which magazine is selected, who lays it out on which wall, and so on. And finally, this is the last couple of images that I brought in. I wanted to talk about this notion of tape. Um, I know that Mondrian, in his later work, 
very often laid out compositions using colored tape, which became a constructive element in its own right. So here's an artist who really is interesting for the, the, you know, the entire gamut of his career going from a kind of late impressionism to the act of purifying and abstracting, distilling his work into the horizontal and vertical element, the primary colors. And once he got to that, he really didn't deviate from it. But what you see in his later work is an effort to make the line itself, which in his earlier work had always been black. And then there were these quadrants of color um, to kind of activate the line itself and give it a material, tactile quality. And the detail that I'm showing you on the lower right is from the lower right of the, the work. So this is, this is just this section right here. And you can see the paint, sort of the, the tape which is painted by Mondrian sort of lifting off and becoming this very tactile element. It's as if he wanted to get the more tactile elements back into his work and to get that sense of factory, even while retaining a sense of the purity of the primary colors and of the abstract composition. And for me, this, this really speaks to Ian Wallace's work. There's a kind of constant engagement and dialectic from the monochrome, the ideal of a kind of purity of art, a framed, perhaps, um, composition that marks itself off as art. And then, whenever he does that, he gets interested in bringing the world back in. And there's a kind of move toward tactility, towards some kind of intrusion from the outside world. So those are some of the, the things that I hope to, that we'll be able to talk about. So thank you. So I will come up. So maybe we can just go back and hear a little bit more about the monochrome. I was interested to see that these monochromes appear kind of punctuating your exhibition here and there. And I thought maybe you could just tell us something about why they're placed the way they are. And also about the format, which I think is somewhat unusual, this very long, narrow format and what you were thinking about. In, in, and we can see that you really, you know, that was consistently carried out. Uh, <coughs> The uh, monochromes, uh, really started the monochromes in 1967 after a number of years of, of painting a, a, a kind of quasi-figurative abstraction, uh, which I felt um, uh, just wasn't, wasn't exciting enough for the time for me. I um, had been quite inspired by seeing the work of Ad Reinhardt, of the minimalist artist of the mid-60s that I was really getting interested in, and who, whose reputations, whose work was coming into view at the time, too, through such magazines as Art Forum magazine. And uh, in any case, I was quite inspired by those particular artists, and, uh, and also going to New York and seeing Malevich in person, seeing White on White and, and works like that. And, uh, realizing that those works that sometimes in reproductions in art history books didn't look very interesting, when you see the real thing, uh, it turned into something else. Um, and I, I referred to it literally as the zero degree of painting, like how to reconstruct my whole relationship to what a picture is. That's what these were all about. Uh, but in a sense, uh, pictures of um, just pure color and space. Uh, and obviously I was writing the uh, thesis on Mondrian at the time, so that certainly informed my work. I was writing art criticism at the time and uh, was paying close attention to recent work. I, I, I remember going down to Seattle to review an exhibition of uh, Frank Stella's work, the, um, um, uh, the Protractor series that was at the Seattle Art Museum, and uh, reading Michael Fried's Shape as Form. Uh, which was uh, for me a very, very informative and deeply thought essay and quite an influential essay on my theoretical thinking about abstract art and picture, you, you bring the question of the frame in, definitely that, that those issues come in there. Shape is form, uh, maybe not everyone has read this. It's a very important essay by Michael Fried and in it he argues that the work of art has to somehow uh, refer to or restate its shape 
So the, these works of art by Frank Stella in particular had unusual shapes, and there was an interesting interplay between the literal shape of the canvas, which might be very tall and narrow or some other mm -hmm. kind of shape, and what was depicted within it. So kind of synergy between those two elements, and I do see that very much here. Yeah. In my thesis on Mondrian, I actually applied in some level um, Michael Fried's thesis about the interior shape of depiction reflecting the exterior shape of the total frame, which does occur in Mondrian's work. So I found that those, those thoughts kind of were congruous there. And I must admit uh, that is partly the inspiration for the idea of critiquing or questioning the pictorial frame and the pictorial rectangle, you might say, of the, of the classical image uh, in these monochrome paintings and, exa and exaggerating the frame. I also was aware of uh, the work of Saul LeWitt at the time, who was one of the earliest of the minimalists to develop a, a serial style of uh, work, as well as Frank Stella, of course. Yeah. Uh, I saw Stella's um, black uh, paintings uh, from Getty's tomb in the Seattle World's Fair of 1962 uh, when I went down there, and I saw my first Barnett Newman in that show, of course, with, which was a blue painting, uh, one, month, one, one month six, with a white stripe down the middle, not it's sort of a little bit like this. And I think of that painting when I think of this painting. Um, in any case, um, yeah, that's where the monochrome started. Uh, but I was only 20, in my mid-20s at the time, 23, that's 24 years old. So uh, I wasn't going to do monochrome paintings for the rest of my life. So. <laughs> So that development of my work, I had to work my way out of that into the real world, as you brought up very effectively in your talk. When, when it seems like you're already doing it in a way with these monochromes because, and, and this is something I haven't asked you about before, but I'm interested to hear what you will say is, why were these, as I understand it, you often hung these outside of the gallery space. In other words, um, in unusual locations, in the stairwell, you know, here next to this exit sign, and there's a sense that when you look at a, a Malevich, he really wanted to affirm that that was a work of art. And in some of his writings, he said, you know, the best place for a work of art ultimately is the museum, because that's where its art status is most clear. And I think that probably Stella would say, Frank Stella would say something like that. But you seem to be wanting to put these things outside the museum or near it, but not always in it or in funny places. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you? Well, I, I think that may what makes me more effective as an artist than an academic is my natural contradictory nature. <laughs> I'm always going against what I really think that I want to do, you know, or should do, or whatever. Uh, in any case, this is in the 60s, too, 1968, a time of instinctive rebellion uh, against the status quo of the time. And uh, of course, I was quite thrilled to be invited by Marguerite Penny, it was, who was the curator at the Simon Fraser University Gallery to do an exhibition with Dwayne London, another artist who I was a uh, close friend who I really liked his work. And, um, but this was 1968, and even though I was thrilled to have a show in a, you know, in a gallery and get the work out there so that the public could see it within the context of an institution, um, we were, I guess we were a little bit cheeky for the time and decided to not show in the gallery itself, but to show in all of the other, as all the other spaces of the university, including in this case, the back stairwell where nobody would normally go. So it was kind of a refusal of the gallery space, symbolic refusal, because in fact, you know, I really wanted to be there. <laughs> right, right, right. And I, I always liked this one next to the exit sign. That's you really know, great. You know, like, no exit painting. You know? It's a kind of right. It's it's kind of a right. And I think you know the notion of executing these works serially is also very different. It's very much of its time. And what Malevich uh, did, he eventually created four black squares but each one is different. And I think he would have resisted the notion of serialization. You know, each black square had to be unique. They're hand painted, they're not drawn with a ruler, they're slightly irregular. And I think the irregularity means that each one is understood as different, separate from the others, even though they may refer to each other. But this is a very different kind of practice, closer to Saul LeWitt or to Carl Andre, where there's a notion of unfolding a progression that has been predetermined, yeah. right? Well, I, I read Malevich's um, and abstraction, all the monochrome, including Barchenko's uh, monochromes, as a, a, a refusal of representation. In other words, all of the given orders of meaning and representations in the world at the time 
by the generation of those artists of the early 20th century, of course, all the terrible things that were happening in the world that led to this one of the stupidest wars. All wars are stupid. This was the stupidest of all unnecessary wars. The First World War, which millions of people died as a result for no particular good reason, um, uh, where it was a part of the rejection of those artists of that order of authority uh, that was represented by a rejection of representation. And I think symbolically as well in the 60s, it was just a part of the spirit of the time, was to critique representation and question those representations. In many ways, the magazine pieces function that way. Uh, the other aspect of that, though, is its contradictory and its converse aspect, is that if one wants to speak about the world, one has to refer to or signify to aspects of the world where those problematics reside, where the, where the content of everyday life resides. That's where the collage material comes in. Right. In effect, it functions allegorically. But, Maybe I'll... Yeah. But for me, um, it, um, uh, the allegories are fundamentally, in the end, political. Uh, and um, uh, that was at least the subliminal intentions of this work was somehow, again, the contradictory nature that was in, I think, all artists' endeavors, but in my personality as well, I think, was you know how to to in in the, your comments on Mallarmé are apropos of this as well how to you know create a work of art that has unity permanence significance meaning seriousness but at the same time break down all of those criteria by which seriousness permanence unity are all <laughs> constructed uh, because we have to question those things at the same time so in fact in magazine piece in effect I take a a unified material, disassemble it, and then reassemble it in the language of what you call serial, minimal, conceptual art, or whatever. So it's kind of transformed and transfigured from one unified state to another unity. But this, as I see it, the magazine pieces anyways, the new unity is one that questions the you might say, the authority of the original object, in effect. And, and I think most collage work works that way. Because the, uh, the essence of collage, uh, something I don't, you brought it up a little bit in some of your comments, uh, was the aspect of the fragment. Yeah. Uh, that in collage, what you're doing is tearing apart or abstracting. The word abstract literally means to remove. You're abstracting from the unity of everyday life a fragment of it that acts as a sign for in my case, especially in this period, disaffection with everyday life, with the signs of everyday life, but it acts as an allegorical sign that points the well, meaning. What, what strikes me in a lot of your work is that when you appropriate something from the everyday world, if it's a photograph that you've taken sort of of the world or a pre-existing image that you're manipulating, is that you subject it to a kind of rigorous order that is very much in contradiction to the order that it was originally in. So this, mm -hmm. here we have it, it's very clear um, case with magazine piece where, you know, first of all, it's laid out, right? So it, it's, it's been completely disassembled. And then you have this kind of, and the word syntax was being used at, in, in the late 60s, mm -hmm. and Michael Fried and other people are using this to suggest a kind of meaningful order in the placement. So things are fragmented, they're taken apart, but then there's a new order, and What's interesting is this kind of part by part. So you don't even, um, you decide that process, but then there are these chance meetings that will happen just because it's every facing page and you haven't decided in advance that you're gonna try to create one specific message, yeah. right? You're willing to allow that chance to occur. Yeah, actually that's really the object of it, is to open up the readings by tearing apart the original sentence so that the words then photos as fragments, and I think Mallarmé's coup de day functions that way. You have to read across and through all of these different syntaxes that exist within the different typographies of the poem to re-suture in your own reading how you reread those texts. And this right. is what happens here. I think um, you know the ideologies of both consumerism or politics or entertainment that exist, for instance, in the magazine pieces and in the piece that I did at UBC in 1971. Actually, I never actually saw the actual installation. It was totally done by mail by Christos Dikiakos for the exhibition, the 1971 collage show. 
uh, and I specified that it would be 17 magazine, right. which was uh, a kind of a teenage <coughs> beauty magazine, uh, which you know deals with the ideologies of cosmetics and beauty, et cetera, and identity, et cetera. Uh, so, and by tearing it apart, it kind of reconstructs the reading of it. it was, I don't the, think I have You might call it a deconstructive uh, kind of uh, uh, deconstructive formalism or something. Yeah, we don't actually have. have yeah, here's. Here's is uh, the one. look uh, uh, Life magazine from May 1970. This uh, work was never exhibited publicly. It was just done as a test piece in the studio. And it was, uh, and then I never had an exhibition after this in Vancouver. Uh, and then I moved to London. And then when uh, Christos invited me to participate in the collage show of 1971, I was still in London. So I just sent the instructions back to Vancouver. Uh, and it was assembled in he did a documentation photograph, and uh, I've only known the photograph. In fact, recently in the traffic show, which was a uh, conceptual art in Canada show, in 1971 there was also a magazine piece done in Montreal that was only sent by mail. I never ever did see the documentation of that until just uh, last year when I saw the traffic show. It <laughs> popped up in that exhibition. So right. I like this piece because it's sort of out of my hands. It's in other people's territory. and. Uh, I usually leave it to curators to choose the magazine and do the installation. So it is a concept piece, and the scheme is really important, and it's given to other people to carry out and to unfold those readings through their choices. So the chance element, too, is like it's not over-determined by me. I've only determined the formal framing of it. Other people determine what is read within that framing. And so it really it moves into that realm of chance that Mallarmé is also talking about, you know, the throw of the dice, that you're not... And I, I get the feeling in Mallarmé, at least in some of his writings, he talks about poetry overcoming chance because it motivates language in a sense. He wants sound and meaning to cohere in a way that he feels in normal language they don't. But you seem to be even going further in just allowing that chance to happen and... Um, letting the spectator really be the one to, to put together the meanings, which might really vary depending on what somebody sees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was Picasso's uh, method as well. I see Picasso's work as just spontaneous playing with the materials. He's got the newspapers there, and he's happily cutting away and pasting them down. And uh, I think by chance, they start to maybe the coup, coup de théâtre, which yeah. is the one that's the coup de day, he just saw it there. I think he, he said, saw okay, it. I'll cut it there. I think he saw know, it anyway. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I, I believe. Just very spontaneous, and that's sort of the way I like working. Mind you, I'm contradictory because I don't always work that way either. There's always a kind of, you know, the schema in effect, the, the formal, what I call the theory of limits, which you touched upon with this image. Yeah. Uh, quite, and I use the term theory of limits um, um, that. Um, kind of is so, about the, the limit of the frame. Like things mean only, this thing, meaning takes its most potent form when it's condensed within something that it's not. In other words, within the frame. And then it's separated from the world around it. But then it refers and activates the world around it through its speciality of its meaning. Um, so in, in the monochromes, you have this very visible white frame, or it could be black or whatever color, you know, depending on, on the progression or where you are, but it's a color that's different from the interior monochrome. And it's very much referring to that edge and that framing and the kind of containment and difference of the object from the wall that's around it. Um, I noticed in some of your monochrome pieces, and I don't want to refer to too many things that I don't have an image of, but some of them, um, I did notice, had a white border on one side and a colored panel on the other, and there would be a photograph in the middle. So this is kind of collage with different elements, now bringing the monochrome and photography together. And the white panel begins to look like the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's setting it apart. It's acting as a kind of frame, but then it's also actually suggesting that it's blending in with the wall, mm -hmm. or it, and in the catalog that I bought, I was flipping through, and in some of the photographs where there are details, the white edge is cropped so that you can't tell if the white is just the white of the paper, you know, because it's just a detail. So you see this white edge, and you don't know if the work ends where the photograph ends or if that white is painted. So you seem to allow for an ambiguity about where the frame is in some cases. 
Yeah, that's, that, um, uh, that aspect of the work is quite programmatic. In other words, it, and actually really follows, again, the, not the dictums, because I don't follow anybody else's laws except my own intuition, but um, uh, of Michael Fried, uh, the idea of the ground or the support. That, and well, that's a Greenbergian observation, too, about the significance of the ground or support and the just or the mark or the image of them is a sign or on the field, you might say, of the support. And it's just part of the, my program about what painting is, is that you have to reveal the field. You have yeah. to reveal the support, which I, so I like to show the weave of the canvas. And on the side of my works, which are unframed paintings, you see the raw canvas. And so the raw canvas, to me, to recognize the raw, literal support for the photographic image in this case, is really important. That's what I like about Picasso's collages. And at his cheekiest, where he doesn't even use glue, he just sticks a pin through to hold it together, he really acknowledges the specificity of the field and the sign is just literally tacked to the field. I like that. There are some examples of Picasso's collages when he was working with wallpaper, and he cut out a wallpaper border that looks like a frame. You know, it's got a, a depiction of molding, and he cuts it out, and there, he just puts these little rectangles which are bordered edges cut out of wallpaper into the very middle. So it's, it makes the frame the very subject of the work. Um, so he's constantly playing. And, and I see, you know, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, and you can let me know what you were thinking, but I, I can't help but see, having looked at many Picassos and having read all those Mar Michael Fried articles as well, but these strips that are going through in tape strike me as interior frames or as a kind of reference to a framing edge that is no longer simply content to be on the very border but is both a kind of narrative line that's um, linking the works but it's also marking a kind of edge but now that edge has become a compositional element is that fair to would yeah you? that's an interesting observation i hadn't seen it as kind of the collapsed lines from the outside now are forming an armature on the inside you know, when I look at those Mondrians with the tape, um, and it seems clear that he he's contradictory, like many artists, I think. And on the one hand, he knows that he's referring to the framing edges with those horizontal and vertical lines within the, the structure of the composition. But he also saw enormous significance in the meeting of a horizontal and vertical element, which for him had almost universal significance. He thought it distilled and condensed the very meaning of nature, you know, that we have. If you think of a tree standing on the ground, it's sort of the vertical meeting of the horizontal contains all other relations. It's this kind of very um, significant subject for him. But we can also think about it very materially as restating the edges of the quadrangle that is the, the edge of the picture. And I think there's a kind of oscillation mm -hmm. in his work. Um, and then, you know, they're very ideal, but they become very material as well. And here, just using this very simple masking tape, even though this isn't colored, but sometimes the tape in your work is colored yeah. and becomes a colored element. Yeah, at the, at the start, I just was using regular drafting tape, uh, which turned out to be very impractical in exhibitions because the heat from the lights uh, caused the tape to weaken and then the pages would start slumping off the wall. So the, the, ne the, you know, the next thing, I started stapling the, um, the uh, pages to the wall then putting the tape over, because I wanted the tape there, because it looked neat. Uh, and then I kind of got a little bit slicker and just said, hmm, I can start using decorative tapes, like colored tapes, wider ones, which formed a, a made it a kind of a stronger uh, compositional element. And, and that's what I tend to do. I leave it quite open what color is chosen. But uh, I, I like to see those colored tapes in there. And they, even the masking tape still has its color too, but uh, now I tend to use the kind of stronger tapes that actually hold the work on the wall a bit better. I don't know how our time is going, but uh, you, you started off with a question about uh, the monochromes and asking me why they were spread through the exhibition. Yeah, I'd like to comment I, yeah, on that, like too. Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Absolutely. And uh, that leads to another different way of thinking about collage, about collage as a kind of grouping of heterogeneous materials within a given frame. And if I'm to look at the career of you know, you know, almost 40 years now of, of working and exhibiting um, as having a direction to it, in fact, I've gone through a lot of different phases and a lot of different moves, you know, thoughts and, and technical uh, approaches. 
And um, uh, now, kind of after all these years, they kind of like have, they're all starting to collide and gather up, especially in an exhibition opportunity like this, which is a retrospective. You see the past and the present coming together. So it's kind of like all a big collage of heterogeneous elements of different strategies and techniques. Um, now, the monochromes, uh, I sort of more or less abandoned the monochromes in 1968, you know, the pure monochromes. Uh, much, and then I brought monochrome painting in again in the early 80s when I was able to do the um, uh, lamination of large-scale color photographs onto the canvas. And I was looking for a support for those photographs that was other than just the usual plexiglass support. And I thought, well, why not canvas again? It's flexible and it's, you know, it's a really good material and I like the quality of it. And, and at that point, it was possible to do the lamination technologically. The, the lamination te technology was available locally uh, by the mid-'80s. So I developed that way. And then, then, of course, because you're using painting as a support, you've got to bring back the issues of painting again. So texture and the, the monochrome and color comes back in again. So there you have that programmatic work, which is really the, the mainstream of my work over the past 30 years or so. But um, uh, not that long ago, about 10 years ago, I started thinking, like, why not bring the monochromes forward, too? Meanwhile, most of the monochromes have been destroyed. The blue and white one that we showed is almost the only one is the original 1967 monochrome. Uh, and there are a couple of other ones out there. Uh, but um, so I, what I did was, with the schema, I remade all of the monochromes that were a part of the original uh, conceptual project and then used them as, uh, I started with an exhibition I did in 2007 with Capdona Jeffries Gallery, used them to kind of fold them in. Actually, no, that's not true. The first time I brought the monochrome back was that blue and white one, which is the only one that survived because I gave it to some friends as a wedding present. Um, and I included it in a show in the Orr Gallery on Hastings Street in 1988 with the um, crosswalk piece, the 1988 crosswalk piece with Rodney Graham and Kitty Byrne in it uh, that's downstairs. Uh, that, that included, in that exhibition, included the blue monochrome. So that's the first time that was brought back, and I like that. But then I brought them back. So in a way, the bringing back of the monochromes, spreading them through the exhibition is a way to use those monochromes as a historical punctuation uh, in and amongst all of the other thematic works um, and to create a kind of a, make the exhibition into a kind of a total collage in effect. Well, I think that, that leads me to another thing I was beginning to realize as I was looking at the exhibition is that we have, you know, it's like, act set it up and in my own mind um, collage normally speaking and the monochrome are opposed historically in their moments of origin and yet what begins to happen in your work especially in the later moments is that the monochrome enters in as a collage element it's a shape it's something that you can quote you can bring it in and it becomes a piece that that can be um, recombined and configured in something that also includes photographs, or it can, as in something like this, and I don't know how much you had to do with the selection of the color of the ground, but it, insofar as you begin to experience the ground, as in Mallarmé, the page, as a kind of constructive element that's holding its own within a composition, um, the support itself is a monochrome, and it's beginning to play that role, and this makes it really clear yeah. here. It becomes a kind of monochrome ground that's yeah, I didn't choose this. This was chosen by the curator. But it, it's really uncanny because in the illustration just down right here, up there, is a, it's an art magazine. So it had a reproduction of a red painted wall by Blinky Palermo, one of my favorite artists, who did great monochromes. Um, and, and it's almost the same tonality as the wall. So I don't know if that's true, Dinah, in the selection of, was that, stimi is that suggested by the Palermo? Installation in there. You're just thinking about your interest in primary color. So that So it works for me. Thank you. And this. <laughs> I like those kind of chance encounters too. <laughs> this one I think is really beautiful as it's laid out, and I. But I'm also interested in that notion of exhaustion that the schema refers to, and here you have an example where. The schema suggested this particular configuration of the grid, which is, I think, also really interesting because it's a grand format, which implies 
elevating the magazine to this kind of almost a cinematic screen-like um, scale. And, and yet, at the same time, then it just kind of ends, right? And it kind of... The end. So I, I wonder well, if you have any comments about why the, the notion of exhaustion was worth mentioning in the schema that you actually thought to include some reference to something, the system just kind of running yeah, out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it just, when I, um, I forget the exact circumstances of how I created that formulation. In fact, the, the formulation, the concept of the formulation for the concept piece was somewhat suggested by, for instance, Lawrence Wiener's formulation, you know, um, but, um, in this case, I was trying to figure, like, what, what do you do with the question of how many pages would complete it, and what do you do with the leftover pages, whatever. I just, to me, it was just leave it to chance. Just whenever the format's exhausted, then if you don't have enough pages, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. And in fact, in the installation here, the installers, uh, I remember, were asking very seriously, like, what do we do about the leftover pages, or if it's too short, or should it be perfectly squared? No, just lay them down until they naturally come to an end, and that's fine. Yeah. And, and these pieces, by uh, the magazine piece, actually even in my original concept of it, in this grid formation, was to mimic the scale of large-scale history painting. And, and I thought of, okay, gee, modern magazines, in effect, like this, are laying out contemporary history the way classical history painting lays out, and especially that Life magazine, one of the Kent State Massacre, uh, lays out modern history and tells us about our moment the way history painting does. And for me, you know, as a poor artist and student at the time, well, no, I was, uh, actually I was an instructor at UBC, <laughs> a poor instructor because we weren't paid that well, but still, um, um, I thought, gee, you know, like for 50 cents for the magazine and a roll of tape, you can make a huge painting that normally would cost an awful lot of money. And I was into doing things pretty fast and furious. But that was the collage, uh, the collage. You know, in Vancouver, right. there were a lot of artists from poets like Bill Bissett and, and Christo Stichiakos. I even got some early collages by Jeff Wall. Yeah. Of, of all, you know, he did fabulous collages because yeah. he did his thesis that I was the reader for his master's thesis on Berlin data and the notion of context. So we were totally into data collage and Holzenbeck and Raul Hausman, et cetera. Kurt Schwitters, of course, is one of the great collage poets of the time. You know, and I think it's maybe one of the historical ironies in a sense that you have this prototype of the Mallarmé poem, which is so rarefied in its use of language. It's actually very beautiful to read, and he's got very intricate syntax. And at the same time, it doesn't really deliver much meaning. It's really the, the play of the words on the page. And I wonder if you can just do you feel that these black lines that are running through in the tape are obliterating a aspects of text have to do with that sense of silence in Mallarmé and how, for, I guess what, what it becomes ironic for me in a sense is that the aftermath of Mallarmé really is Dada, the artists who perhaps got most interested in concrete poetry and using words that don't make sense were the Russian Zaum poets um, who are interested in illogical poems and just beyond sense, or the Dada artists who, you know, um, Zara talked about just cutting up a newspaper and taking the words out of a paper bag one at a time. You know, so that notion of chance, just whatever happens. And, but that's the legacy of this very pure, rarefied form of writing poetry and making beautiful pictures on a page that was Mallarmé. And you're kind of engaging both aspects of that with the chance on one side and... Mallarmé was a bit more contradictory. He was a super purist idealist, but also he was, I mean, he edited a fashion magazine yeah. and wrote all of the essays for a fashion magazine advising young ladies what, what theater to go to, what to wear, what perfume to check out, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he did poems on, on, on candies, on rocks. Uh, the most beautiful of his poems, I think, was the ones to his daughter and his wife that were painted on, were written on fans. Uh, like, you know, like fans, yeah. and there were poems that were jokes about the fans and comments on the personalities. So he, he was kind of, and his occasional poems, his, the funniest poems he ever, or it's just on uh, his address poems. I don't uh, know those. The, yeah. Which were, um, he would make jokes about the receiver that the, the postman would have to read the address in the poem that was the address on, oh. the, on the letter that would be sent. 
to the person receiving yeah. the letter. So he was kind of, he was a purist, but he was also, you know, he liked to play with poetry too, as we all do. And uh, just about that aspect of concrete poetry in Vancouver, very early, concrete poetry had a place in the language here very, very early. Um, and, you know, such in individuals as even back to Earl Burney uh, uh, wasn't a concrete poet, but he definitely experimented with poetic forms quite early. And um, people like Bill Bissett, uh, Jerry Gilbert, and all of the local poetry people. Uh, we had a really good, more rigid formalist poets too, uh, but uh, the relationship between poetry, beat culture, and collage uh, forms of poetry were very, very strong in Vancouver and a big influence on myself. I was really into it, I know that. Yeah, that's also something that, um, you know, Picasso was surrounded by poets, and um, among them Apollinaire, uh, Max Jacob, and others. And also Malevich was surrounded by po poets. So it seems to be this very interesting um, phenomenon that happens recurrently in, the, in 20th century art that these moments of innovation seem to happen not only in the isolated realm of one art or another, but because artists, filmmakers, poets, and musicians are all talking to each other. And that seems to have been very much yeah. what was happening here in Vancouver as well. Yeah. What was it uh, Valerie said about Mallarme, uh, Mallarme's coup de day? He said he tried to raise uh, uh, language to the level of the stars. Uh, right. Maybe I'm raising the page or language to the level of the grid, <laughs> like a la Carl Andre or something right, like right. that. You know, so. when, when maybe one, one final aspect about this that would be interesting to touch on is um, the sense that, so you've raised it in a sense to the status of history painting. And I think for the duration of the exhibition, it's grand, it's on the wall, it invites reading, and you know, it will get a lot of serious attention. And then normally, as I understand it, after the exhibition, this kind of work um, will just be thrown out. Just goes to the garbage can. Just, yep. that's it. So, um, and then it has to be re-executed the next time that it will be installed, because I guess, once you put that tape up on there, you're never going to get it off the wall yep. unless you and devote enormous yeah. time and effort. Yeah. So and there's this sense of the fragility, the, the kind of... There's the schema. That's the, the permanence, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe you could just say a word about the medium of the schema. It's on vellum, is that correct? Or what, what's uh, the... Yeah, it's uh, transparent vellum. I wanted it to look like kind of an engineering drawing, in effect like with simple instructions, really simple instructions and a simple plan like assembling a piece of Ikea furniture or something um, right. without it being too officious. In fact, my instructions are kind of like a concrete poem in itself, as a matter of fact, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah. And Lawrence Weiner, for instance, one of my favorite artists, he's got a beautiful piece on the outside of this building right here. Uh, you know, there, there's a poet. He, he's a poet, and he calls himself a sculptor. Right. You know, because his poems are all about displacements in space. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there's all these kind of crossovers. So. Yeah. yeah. Were there any other comments that you wanted to, to make about any of these works that we've looked at? Um, if you'd like, we can open things up mm -hmm. to the audience for some questions sure. at this point. Does anyone want to raise the first question? I know there's some art historians in the crowd. <laughs> All right, well, I always have a question ready. Oh. Um, so I was wondering if this work, this iteration of the work magazine piece might not be criticized for the choice of an art magazine as opposed to a magazine that deals more directly with some other element of contemporary life as it had in the past, for example, like entertainment or politics. At the same time, I noticed that it's called Bomb, and I wanted to know if either of you had anything to say about that, um, especially given the contemporary, um, the concerns that we have about militarization um, and relationships to other large forms of, um, you know, whether it's, uh, ex I guess, exploitation and representation and the way that all of those things are sort of interrelated. Um, well, as I say, I leave the choice of the magazine up, not, all, not in all cases, but in most cases, the choice of the magazine is up to the curator, and in this case it was. 
um, any representation is absolutely properly open to criticism of whatever whatever value system anybody takes to the work, you apply it to the, and that's the power of representation, because it either challenges or reifies what our expectations are in relationship to our values. And that's how we exercise judgment in front of a work of art, whether it fulfills our expectations or disappoints us or whatever. Um, even on those levels, if it's effective, if it engages our disappointment, it's actually working as a work of art already. Uh, a really bad work of art that challenges our notion of what good works of art are um, is a good work of art. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? To me, in a sense, the inclusion of a magazine like that demonstrates the kind of fluidity between the art world and the commercial world. It's not so pure that, I mean, it is an art magazine and it's a well known one, but. You know, there's advertising, there's bright colors, there's different kinds of stories. So it's not an absolute divide, and maybe it raises that question. What's, what are the links between these different kinds of magazines? Um, Ian, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the very differences that, between you and some of the artists that uh, Parallels have been drawn with. Thinking, for example, that um, for people like Picasso and Brock, for Mondry and, and on some levels, uh, Dada Collage, just there was there's a kind of sense of uh, optimism in that work, and there's a sense that there, there's a possibilities of in, um, constructing a new language, um, which seems to be not at all what you're interested in, or or that's a possibility that you don't that, that doesn't exist at this moment in time. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I have my pessimistic moments, and. Uh, uh, when I'm cynical, it's usually with a sense of humor, um, but um, and uh, but I'm I don't know. I mean, part of my program, basically, and part of like the idea of the strategies of my work is to put the possibility of making meaningful work in anybody's hands. In other words, the question about de-skilling, uh, which is what Picasso had to do, and I won't go into detail on that. I've got all kinds of theories about why P Picasso, who was a great draftsman, de-skilled. He purposely did some of the ugliest, most stupidest paintings you could possibly do at the time. And why did he do that? There's reasons for that. But um, um, in, in my work, I mean, the, the de-skilled aspects of this, it, it's open to anybody to come up with their own way of doing a de-skilled work, which opens up uh, languages of expression to people that, say, don't conceive of themselves as having talent in the normal authoritative level of the inspired genius talented artist that has special powers that nobody else has. I'm kind of a populist on that level. I'm interested in opening up languages that spread out the possibility of expression out to all kinds of people that don't either have the resources or the so-called talent to, to do that in the normative sense of what great makes a great work of art. There's other ways to make interesting and great art than the usual one. And not that I don't respect artists of great talent, like I have tremendous respect to, uh, you know, ballet dancers. I was at the ballet the other night, and I was just like, <coughs> wow, I wish I could kick my legs like they do. But, um, and musicians, like I, I, I always wanted to be a good musician, but I just don't have the talent for it. So I understand the limitations of talent. Uh, and I'm interested in this de idea of de-skilling as a utopian, poss opening up utopian possibilities of, of opening up languages of expression to people that don't have those. In fact, I play music, but I play bad music. And I dance, but only by myself, because I'm such a bad dancer, but still. Um, anyway, sorry, I don't know, that's a silly way of answering your question. But <laughs> um, no, not entirely. I, I mean, uh, you know, there's a sense of Picasso kind of embracing that, uh, the, tec the technique of, of modernism, not, not yeah. modernism in the largest sense. Um, and so there's a kind of embrace of, of that, the, uh, you know, the newspaper as a kind of new uh, form of communication that has levels of possibilities that are quite interesting. But I don't see that um, magazine piece has any of that, uh, I, that desire to kind of embrace the format uh, that you're taking apart. I don't know what to say. 
I'll let somebody else answer that one. <laughs> Do we have another question? <laughs> oh, in the back. I was wondering if, um, when, I, when I looked at this in the gallery, it made me think of uh, the navigation of uh, magazines on an iPad. I wondered if you are, you'd come across that where, uh, especially in art magazines like Freeze or I think the Gagosian app also, um, uh, when you tap the screen, it, you will get a, a linear um, thumbnail of, that looks very much like what we're looking at right now, and, and will even you know, go vertical and make a grid, and I just thought it was a bit ironic, uh, considering what you'd said, that it had come back to the magazine for the purpose of navigation. Yeah, an interesting observation, actually. Um, I've run into that myself. Um, you know, on the iPad, when you go to kind of subscribe to a magazine, it's like the magazine rack and everything's in a row. Like, and, and that's the way they're often displayed, too, in stores, of course. Maybe that's a good reason for me to construct yet another kind of disassembled kind of um, composition and not so grid-like. I don't know if that would help uh, deconstruct the, the normative reading that's become a normative reading of, the, of uh, literature and images these days. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'll think about that. Maybe hmm. the next magazine piece might be something looking totally different. Might be just this. I like the one of the Mario Mertz ones just stacked on the floor. But yeah. You know, yeah. Hmm. Well, it speaks also to the, the like the the use of the um, uh, the reference to the schema again in a different kind of context. In fact, with the iPad, it's like a continuous line. It will it'll, it never becomes a grid in that in that same sense um, and it does sort of serve a, as a reference to the limitation of how you might read in that format that you would always have to skip every single page go through every single page in order to get to the next one um, I had a question myself about um, Christine and I were walking through the gallery today and we were looking at the Pan Am scan and I noticed when I uh, was reading through the catalog that you wrote a little bit about your use of photography and your interest in photography in the intellectual sense as a kind of collage or a fixed a way of affixing uh, a certain sort of capture um, as a kind of reference to collage or the process of collage. And I wondered if you had any comments about that. Uh, uh, well, uh, Pan Am Scan uh, was, you know, just a literally a scan of five photographs across uh, a panorama. And um, the, um, what I was doing at the time was photographing uh, reflections in windows of, uh, st of the street. And I really liked the mapping of what I call hardcore reality or the street onto, onto a window. And then you see through the window and you see the people in the building, in the building behind the window and one form of reality is mapped onto another. So you have a kind of a, a, a natural and incidental type of collage, which everybody in a modern city experiences all mm -hmm. of the time. It's just a part of our, our sensory environment that we live in. Um, and those, those works, including Street Reflections, Pan Am Scan, were a photographic attempt to identify that passage between uh, that idea about collage between uh, the what I call hardcore and softcore reality. Um, uh, that was a 1969, 1970 attempt at kind of soft core theory of what that might have all meant, actually. And um, those were I important works. It was me. fun looking at those um, with you, Allison. And, and it was, I, I went back and looked at them again later, and, and it looked to me like um, you were also thinking about. Certainly there was this division. There's, if you look at the piece, um, there's the reality is on the left side and then the windows are all on the right, so you see the, the edge of the window and the reflection. But I think there were five panels and they were mm -hmm. each taken at some short time after each other. So you mm -hmm. can see a person walking down the street and then the next mm -hmm. one you see them a little further away and then you see somebody entering the field of vision and then they're further away and so on. So it has this kind of temporality 
also. Um, and you see the different configurations and the chance effects. But I was wondering, again, it seems like you're interested in establishing a kind of quasi-narrative. There isn't really a story, but if you look closely, you see somebody moving or um, getting farther away or, or you know, maybe two people walking together. Um, so what, there's an almost narrative element yeah, there, in there, that sequencing. There, there was, and technically there's how to organize five photographs, how to, how to put that into a composition involves narrative like you identified in your yes. talk. Um, uh, and this will lead on to next week's talk with Stan Douglas on cinema and the oh, narrative okay, aspect great, too. Yeah. Um, but there's another aspect of the narrative to that Pan Am scan that, I mean, it seems very incidental, but it's something I really remember. I was with Jeff Wall at the time. We were walking on, on, um, on Piccadilly, and there's a church there. And we uh, were in this church, kind of just observing the church. And we came out, and there was a lady sitting on a bench just outside the church. And she was crying, just sobbing to herself. So uh, Jeff and I were quite touched. And we actually we walked further down the street, and we were both kind of quiet, because we were both, I think, thinking about this lady on the bench. And at that moment, I felt I had to do a work. And I had my camera, and I just stopped, and I said, Jeff, just a sec, I gotta do a work here. So I did the Pan Am scan. And I've always associated the Pan Am scan with that incident of seeing the lady crying on the bench. Now, there's a narrative there that has no obvious relationship to the subject matter, but it's one of those things in everyday life that stimulates one's juices to actually make a statement about what's out there. Anyways, there's the, there's the subliminal narrative. And she, but she, was she in it? I didn't see her. I oh, no, no, she's no, not she's in not the in picture it. because okay. she was further down the street in the churchyard. We'd already walked further down. And it was the um, Pan American ticket office. Uh, and so I kind of was interested in that as a site. So, yeah. And there's a further story to that piece, which I won't go into now. It's quite a funny story. But, well, you can't. <laughs> uh, you have to do it now, right? You can't. Okay, I got back to Vancouver. This was in 1970. I come back to Vancouver. And uh, I was preparing work for a show with Ron Hunt, Poetry Made by All, Changed the World. It was at the Vancouver Art Gallery. There's featured situationist and avant-garde Russian art. And um, Ron Hunt invited me to contribute some works to it. So I thought, oh, I'll do Pan Am Scan, but I'll do a video of it. So on the Pan American Ticket Office in the Bard Building here in Vancouver, I taped Pan Am Scan to, the, to one of the balustrades there, right? And, and I had a video person doing video, and I was lecturing about the nature of the city as a grid, et cetera, like the magazine piece. And um, then um, and I had, and then I went to turn to have the video zoom in on the Pan Am scan to make my point. And then there was this uniformed officer standing in front of me who was starting to tear the photograph off the wall. And I say, stop, this is art. Don't tear it off the walls. This is art, right? And he looks at me defiantly in the eye, and he just like goes zip like this. So the work in the exhibition actually has that tear in it, uh, right across the second from the top of the five photographs, which I repaired just with some uh, just some scotch tape. So the Vancouver Art Gallery has the original one, right? So uh, in any case, I was absolutely furious. So I took the, his hat. I wanted to punch him, but he was really old, um, and he was a he had a uniform too. Uh, so I took his hat and I like threw it onto the ground, just out of fury. And I don't get mad easily, but I was mad. Um, well, he ripped it. That's yeah, he ripped bad. my That's picture. Bad. You know, yeah. What can I say? And, uh, and so he was trying to get his hat, his symbol of authority, and he kept kicking it in front of him so he couldn't reach it. <laughs> so I had to pick it up off the ground, give it, and I apologized to him. And then we got into this really funny discussion about the law of the building, very Kafka-esque. Uh, and of course, the American embassy was in the building, and there were uh, protests against the Vietnam War at that time, of course, and the American, so they were very sensitive about weird things happening on their building. Even conceptual art being tacked to the outside of the building was considered a threat. Uh, <laughs> but we got over it, and I didn't get arrested or anything like that. <laughs> I would have if I'd hit him, I think, but you know, that was my. <laughs> Anyways, there's another, there's yeah, the, there's the, the sequel life. to the narrative there. That's so. where the, the street really yeah. comes in. And yeah, <laughs> conceptual art can be funny, I suppose, I don't know. Yeah. and tragic. Well, we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if there's anything else. Oh. Just, just wondering where um, 
the Hayward pieces, the kind of new language that you're developing, you know, taking pictures of an intervention, and whether that's something you're thinking about or taking further, or just where that fits in kind of your recent comments? Well, I think the uh, Hayward Gallery piece, which is the painted stairwell uh, piece that's on the, uh, on the second floor, um, I say that really relates to the Mon my interest in Mondrian and my museum series pieces, and it's the back staircase of the Hayward Gallery, which is kind of an ugly, brutalist architecture, you know, not a, not a pretty building at all. I did, however, see a very important exhibition in 1971 when I was living in London, uh, Art and Revolution, which was uh, the, you know, a major exhibition of Russian avant-garde art, which was, for me, an eye-opener, too. Um, but, uh, so, when I was there, it was quite recent I did that, I, they repaint, they painted in these kind of primary colors, Mondrian, parts of the, of, the, of the back staircase of this rather ugly, brutalist building. Um, and I thought they were quite beautiful. So I just had to do something with it. And it, you know, it, I like spatially, it, the way it works spatially. And it's a, a very formal piece. I, I think somebody like Michael Fried might even like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that he's writing about photography. Yes, and why it matters. <laughs> Any last questions? I guess you exhausted their questions, guys. <laughs> We're mad it's been exhausted. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. Um, thank you to Christine for coming all the way. And yes, thank you thank to you Ian for much. being thank such you. a gracious thank host of yeah. um, so many questions. And we're looking forward to hearing more next week. And I want to thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Thank